All right, we are live with half the behavior panel and half of Beva and Barnes. <laughs> and Bar Barnes is undoubtedly going to be a few minutes late, but he's he's watching right now, probably. I'm sure he probably is. And to uh, introduce what we are talking about tonight, we are going to watch a little video as soon as I find the button. I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, me either. Are you guys? Well, it's, and it's, you know, it's still good at body language. Up. You have to be able to read lips. <laughs> so we will do this again. Isn't this well done, guys? This is a highly professional operation here. Now that you mention it, speaking of which, while you do that, I'm going to go retweet the link. Great idea. Let's see. I did my tweeting. Uh, quote retweet. We are live I now. Knock myself out of a stream. This is just perfect. So we will. Oh, you knocked yourself stream. out. Well, I it, to knock myself out of the stream. Oh no! Brilliantly done. We'll make Here use we of this go. time now. Everyone who's watching, tweet the th tweet the link out and and uh, invite people to join while Go Eric. Yeah, yeah well, Eric has his problems with the oh, the F. Yeah, I was waiting for the Fs to come in. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Fs from Fry, because he gets those all the time. Okay, any more Fs? Come on, guys. I deserve oh, it. The Fs and Boomer Boomer Eric, you're going to have a new nickname. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. I'm... <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's introduce ourselves, starting with Greg. Yeah, I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. And I put together the number one online body language course with Scott, Body Language Tactics at bodylanguagetactics.com. And I'm part of the behavior panel with three other folks who, are, who outshine me by far. And we do a show once a week. <laughs> Scott. All right. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. And I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language and creator. There it is. A body language tactics with Greg. And I'm part of the behavior panel as well with three guys who are much smarter than I'll ever be. And Barnes. Hey, hey. Oh I mean, uh, this is uh that's not a blood stain that don't worry. Everybody. It's, uh, it's all clean. It's all, uh, there's a legitimate explanation for it. Uh, glad, glad to be here. I uh, just got off with a judge. No comment about that here. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you got off the strip in Vegas, Robert. That's like one of those one of the pina coladas that they serve you on the on the Vegas Strip. <laughs> it's uh, my orange juice mixed with uh, vi different uh, vitamins, uh, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D. They're in liquid form uh, uh, from my I good friend in that. Austin, Texas, <laughs> and the uh, uh, and uh, turmeric, which is uh, I usually have it in the morning, but I just got off the hearing, so now I have, I'm getting it now. <laughs> Perfect. And last, but definitely not least. Viva Fry, David Fryhead. I am wholly underqualified of the crowd, but I was the lawyer who at one point said enough is enough when I realized I could make money by putting bread on a GoPro. And now I make YouTube videos and it's fun. And Robert, Robert and I have our Viva Barnes local, vivabarneslaw.locals.com, where you got to see the stuff that Robert puts out there. It's beautiful, beautiful content exclusive yeah. to locals. Yeah, he really is. You're putting a lot out there with your hush hush and um, little short videos. And by short, though, they're like 10, 15 minutes long sometimes. They're not, you know, he's not just doing a two minute special saying, hey, what's up, guys? Okay. Hey, I did a video. He's actually <laughs> I, getting a little in depth. 
Yeah, the because uh, uh, for the subscribers, I can do stuff that's confidential, and so I'm tempted to do uh, uh, just a rant on how to deal with incompetent state judges just after today. But that's another story, or maybe uh, corrupt uh, prosecutors like what's up happening up in Wisconsin. But I, I should exercise discretion for the time being, so I will. I'll try. <laughs> yeah, Robert's videos—they're scripted and they're well scripted. They're scripted like novels. It's—it's—they're—it's it's amazing. And I'm not just saying that because I'm biased. Well, okay. I was going actually, through the true crime stuff. That was Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you actually write these out, Barnes, or do you, because uh, the way you can rattle things off when you're, you know, with with Viva and just go on and on and on, I'm like, it's a, uh, it's, a unique skill. The well, same as Frederick Douglass. Uh, you you know, he learned to speak and read from Cicero's oratory on oratory, where the way you remember information is you put it in different uh, houses within, say, within a, different rooms within a house. Or whatever associational method of memory you have. So, like, my my associational memory for numbers is associated with presidential or congressional elections. So, if it's like twenty one, it's like okay, nineteen twenty one, year after Woodrow Wilson lost. Da, da, da. So, the things like that. So, it's just some associational memory makes it much easier for me. I'm just walking around a room, so it's memory not like works. scripted in a written form. It will be okay. architected in my head as to I'm going to this room, to this room, to this room, and this room as I go through the speech with some what? trigger that reminds me of what is associated therewith. When I'm in the shower, I can't remember if I wash my hair half the time. <laughs> well, I never have that problem. <laughs> wow. I knew where it was. I might be able to. <laughs> so that's and a mind way, palace, basically. For Greg and Scott, when you say that it's the most popular online body language, the true the true crime workshop, how many users and how many subs and how many how many members do you have now, or how many people? It's not, the true crime workshop isn't its body language tactics, right? Yeah. Okay. And Scott keeps so, tracking numbers. Yeah. yeah, so we got let me we we've got a whole lot. I don't <laughs> want to tell you exactly how much. <laughs> okay, because I I, noticed, you, uh, I think I saw a milestone that you put up on the on. Did I see it on YouTube or somewhere else? A milestone in terms of numbers. Oh, of no, that's our channel. That's behavior channel. Oh, yeah, that's that's the, that's, yeah. The that's the behavior panel. That's the behavior panel. I'll ten email million views this. on behavior panel. Yeah. Amazing. One hundred sixty-five thousand subscribers. It's going pretty well for us, and we're not you, yeah. but we're we're getting there. Yeah, yeah, we started in in uh, April of last year. Yeah, May, May sixth. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. monumental, actually. It's yeah, their monumental. analysis of Michael Jackson stuff confirmed a hypothesis I had of his years ago, which is that Jackson is? was not an abuser. That they don't draw those conclusions, but this is my own conclusion: is he always wanted to be a kid and stay a kid, mm. and he mm -hmm. uh, and he kept trying to recreate childhood. I mean, it was his great grievance from the time he was little that he never got to be a child, and, and he so was upset with being eight years old. Rather than uh, like usually mm -hmm. child abuse relationships are a power dynamic, whereas Mike Jackson wanted to believe he was eight uh, mm -hmm. or 10 or 12, Peter 14, Pan whatever it was. And he was locked into it. He wanted people around him that gave him the illusion that, in fact, he still was. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact that psychologically he communicated like a six year old or a ten was was fascinating analysis in his body language and whatnot. His, his body language is just awkward as it could be with that that whole thing and that nope, nope, that stuff. And yeah. we'll, we'll probably anger some Michael Jackson fans by t even talking about the fact we covered him. So, yeah. Well, that, well I, I think he was innocent. So all the Michael Jackson fans can uh, can can uh, be happy with me. But with Michael Jackson, like I and I, I don't know if you covered it, but did his behavior change over time? Because I remember what, what I think I remember is in his younger years, he was nowhere near as um, b bizarre as he became in his later years. Well, you know, we did. We only watch what you should know is when we watch these videos, we don't do a, a cascading, hey, I went back and watched eight or 10 or 12 years of this. What we do is say, hey, here's what we see right now. And in this case, we're looking at a specific time frame. And we've asked for other where he actually denies sexual allegations. And we've gotten a couple of good ones. So we'll go back and look at those denials of sexual allegations and then weigh in mm -hmm. on what we think there. But all we did here was say, did he have he said he only had two plastic surgeries on his nose. And we were like, yeah, well, here's a good baseline for not telling the truth because it's clear he had more done. But we didn't, Viva, we did not go back and look across those because we just didn't see real value in doing that at the moment. But yeah. It was really good analysis on the, at the lawyer's mistake in the deposition. But that's a natural tendency for lawyers. They want to get yes or no answers. They, they look for admissions rather than get, getting real intel. Yep. Which is just let let people talk, and they'll often hang themselves if you if you let them do it. Yep, people are when people start talking. In my old world, we would call those source leads, but when a person starts talking, they'll emphasize words, and that gives you exactly what's going on inside their head, and you get to follow it down. Now you, you can't know their thoughts, but you can know what they're stressing, and then you get to follow that. 
Okay, real quickly, I've got a couple super chats, and I didn't do the uh, the Viva warning, but because we're going to try to kind of cover the workshop a little bit, it'll be harder for me to go off topic with some of these. But you know, I'll go ahead and do these couple here since I didn't do any kind of warning. Um, Ria Curito, I guess Blaze can't do business with a firm anymore due to politics. Are you going to rep them now, Barnes? I know nothing about this story. So, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, ha happy to represent Glenn Beck and any of that crew. Uh, to my knowledge, they do have plenty of competent, capable counsel. I've represented Dave Rubin before. Um, mm. So, uh, you know, Glenn Beck and Alex Jones don't always get along. So there's you know, that dynamic. But I'm happy to represent neighbors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They are now. They're very much so. Just right, right up the road. Though, you know, less antagonism now than in the past. Uh, but, yeah, happy to represent any of them. You know, I was going through the true crime. I got through part of the true crime workshop. I, I, I was going through. I was. This way I uh, research stuff, I, I know I'm supposed to go through chapter by chapter, but sure. the, my, my mother taught me to read the ending of the book first, so you're never disappointed. <laughs> so the uh, that, that you know, so because of it, I was like, I just go through the whole outline of the whole book, find what I think is really what grabs me right away, and start there, and then go back to the beginning. I, I should have. But it is some fascinating, fascinating stuff. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah, we worked hard on that thing. We're still doing it. Every you know, a, a new well, module comes out every week. It's also very oh, useful. When you okay. see these cases of innocent people that get railroaded, if cops would have yeah, employed yeah. the techniques that you guys talk about, much less risk of it occurring. The level of police who, even in with well-intended, make mistakes is just still off the charts, unfortunately. Well, the projection yeah. that people use when you're interrogating, yes. like I always said, I interrogated for intelligence and we needed actionable, not mm -hmm. confession as much. When you're after confession and that's the only thing you're after, and you project onto someone, it's very difficult to come back from that. We, I was something about Michael Jackson where you said the baseline that you got was the answer on his nose because and most people with a reasonable sense of uh, reason would know that he had more than two surgeries. When you're dealing with people who are playing on the semantics of words so that what they're saying technically, even in their own mind, is not going to be a lie so they don't you don't test that mm. baseline. And say like Michael Jackson says, yeah, I had 10 procedures, but only two of them were plastic surgery. So you right. might get a false baseline because the semantics in their own framework make it such that they're not lying. So how do you how do you actually get around that or how do you detect that? So a couple of things. It, that's one of the things we do in this workshop is we go into this thing we call the liar's loop. All lies are not created equal because the amount of time you have to rehearse a lie changes everything. So if I have eight months to practice a lie, I'll deconflict it and we can run through that process here in a minute. But if I have eight months to deconflict my lie, I can of course tie it back into my story and make all the details work and all that. But if I catch you right on the spur of the moment and I go at you about a lie, now you have to shuffle and change gears and go into fight or flight, create on the fly, deconflict that on the lie, on the fly, pitch that lie, do all of, so yeah, I guess we could go into it here, but as we go into that liar's loop, it shows you a different way of thinking. Um, you, Scott, you want me to jump in here? You, yeah, you, man, have at it. You're, yeah, you're on a roll. Go with it. Yeah, so guys, we put a, a five-step process together for how people actually lie. And I taught interrogation for 20 years off and on. I taught resistance in the 80s, and then all through the 90s, I taught actual interrogation, and then more advanced stuff to lettered agencies in the, in the 2000s. The thing that I always had a hard time with is how can I put words to something that I do instinctively and don't know the right way to put it? And if it's not a process, you can't teach it. Humans learn through process. I can't teach you how I feel. I can say how I feel, but it doesn't work. So we came up with this process about how people actually lie. Step one is a trigger. Whatever that motivation is, and it can happen anytime. Uh, someone who's murdered someone and is hiding a body, well, there, there's their trigger. But I can also get pulled over by a cop and him say, where are you going in such a hurry? And me say, well, uh, and make up something there. So that can be the trigger. Trigger can be spur of the moment, can be long-term, can be something you've done, or can be something that causes you to want to protect someone. So a trigger is step one. As soon as you hit step one, then the next is it forces you into fabricate or fabricating, which is step two. And when I fabricate something, there are many ways I can tell a lie, but typically those ways of lying are broken into a handful of categories. I would say, Omission, leaving out information, commission, creating something from plain cloth, transference, I take your life and turn it into mine, and embellishment, the fish is bigger than it was. Each of those comes with its own language and with all those pieces, and we can talk in more detail about that, but it's about that fabrication piece and how much time you have to do it, Viva, you're dead on as to how good you get at it. If I can sit and rationalize over 18 years that, well, this is not really plastic surgery, it's filler, or this is not really that, it's this then it makes it easier for me to tell the lie and a lot less stressful. So once I start that lying process, then I move into the next step. 
And the next step is deconflicting. And in deconflicting, I'm trying to tie the lie back to my you life. You're so fast at this, Greg. I'm, I'm sitting sorry. here going and finding that I'm demonetized with you guys already. And Jesus. <laughs> yeah, sorry, guys. So no, that's cool. <laughs> deconflict means now I have to untangle this lie from my life. And that means you, you, you guys as attorneys deal with it all the time. Whoever is trying to hide something, they have to deconflict all that or it, or it comes apart. The story comes apart. Whether that's law enforcement trying to figure out how to cover up something in, in the case of, of something corrupt or whether that's the person who actually committed the crime trying to deconflict that in their life. Where was I at two o'clock? Well, if I was here at two o'clock, how was I there at three? They have to deconflict that whole story. So lies of omission get tougher. And then as I work through the mechanics of that, to your point, I say, well, no, it wasn't really plastic surgery. It was this or that. Now I have, I meet the person who is asking me about the step and we'll go to step four. And step four is actually when I pitch the lie. This is actually the lie telling, the stuff we all think of as lying. And it's a much stronger process to get to pitch than it is to actually do the pitch. If I had time, now I'm going to be relaxed. If I didn't have time, I'm going to be more scrambly. And that's when you start to see all the body language and the behavior and the change in the voice and the fight or flight and all of those pieces. And I push back on the lie. I hear something like, and then that says you're hiding time. So I push back on it and force the person into the next step in the lie. And that is the defense of that lie. Now they have to give me details to support their made up story. And I can then either let them pass or I can force them back into deconflict, back into pitch, back into defend, and force them into a bind where they can't get out. That's how you get questions, by the way. Yeah, that's where you want to get them to at that point. That's what you're doing as you go through there. Because once you get them, so once they've started defending and you can get them back into fabrication, then back after fabrication, they got to go back to deconflict. They got to back to pitch again what the, what they've come up with. Then you get into that, and you they have to defend it. So you want to throw. And we call that the death spiral of a lie. Yep. So that's where it, it all. When you get them boxed in, that's where you end up, and that's where it falls apart. And now I, I got to ask another question that I've been thinking about because between Greg and Scott, you seem to have two different personalities, or at the very least, two different personas. Whereas Greg, for whatever the reason, I think you would be meaner and Scott, you seem like a <laughs> friendly guy. Do you change your strategy or do you take people with different temperaments for different types of uh, individuals to examine or do yeah. you change as needed? So yes, and I'll give you a great example. I always look meaner. It just, I always had that. I used to have really flaming red hair when I was young and that's a plus because people remember you. <laughs> it's one of those rare things that red hair gives you a plus in, but it was, it was, a great thing for me to have really chisel bone structure in those days and look mean. And I would often play bad cop. And the, the interesting part of that is more than one time, I would often choose women as interrogation partners because of our brains working differently, the difference in the way we looked and all that. And I would give women a signal for when I was supposed to be the bad guy. And, you know, they would signal, I'd walk in and get aggressive and scream and yell and pound the wall. <laughs> Next thing I know, the woman's up there screaming and yelling and pounding the wall too. It's just infectious. And I would have to then turn to be the soft guy and go, hey, man, she's crazy. You need to be really careful with her. <laughs> and I did had that happen more than once, at least two times I can tell you about. One was with a redheaded first sergeant who was about my size. And so two twin redheads at Sears School doing that to someone, the interrogation leader came in and said, hey, guys, this is good cop, bad cop, cop not psychos or us. And he put somebody <laughs> else in here. So, yeah, it depends. We we It's role play, right? Yeah, and like in, in my case, if I'm one of my favorite things to, to deal with is the embezzler. That's one of my very favorites. So what you have to do, and or what I like to do, is keep in mind when you're talking to this person, all they have to do is 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 four words. You know, I want my lawyer, or I'm going to call Robert Barnes, and then I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm out. And it's like hit the road. Okay, be was that I'm out. So I have to be. So my thing is, if I seem nice, I can be mean too, but I'm usually not. But I like to be the, the kind of person they want to hang out with or be around. So I try to sort of be not funny with them, but give them, make them feel relaxed. Whereas Greg, you just take a look at him and everything tightens up. You know, it could, be, it could go sideways on you quick. So since they can, they can get out easily, I want to make them comfortable so they want to stay there and talk to me. So I'm trust the you want to hang out with. You know, that honey much voice, more powerful Scott. than fear. Much more powerful than fear. Scott, yeah, you have that honey it's voice to where you're just like, I mean, that soft, that light Southern accent. I mean, should be familiar to Barnes, but I mean, it's, I'm sure you talk people into just about anything. Just like, where, where, where are you going? 
well, why are you leaving? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's a point in, in interrogation where you where you go from the tone I'm talking now down to this tone, right. and you want to tell them that everything's going to be okay because we all make mistakes. Yeah, yep. and so you get in that. So once you once you get it down that low thing, they'll start listening. Your brain just turns just starts accepting from what I've from what I've experienced. This is there's no research on this, but your brain sort of opens up and and starts listening to someone who's talking to you in a soothing voice. So I've had a lot of practice doing it really low and making it sound like everything's going to be fine. You just, you just have to find out why you did this. I mean, that's the that's the road you go down. In, in my opinion, aging is an interrogator's friend. It just is. When you're young, your head's all spun up and you got all that stuff going on when you're in your 20s. I was very physical and all that. But as I've aged, I'm much more calm. I'm, I don't need to push as hard to get to that information. I can take my time and build trust. And trust is powerful. <laughs> Uh, and I was going to say to the super chat you just saw, I'm a, I was a surprising ass a hole during a de depositions, but I think that that's probably just youth. And over time, I would probably become calmer. I, I would have liked to have seen Robert's evolution over time, but I suspect I Robert, Robert, Robert yeah. plays the person. I, 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 I would imagine that much. You know, I learned a lot. I worked for a big plaintiff's lawyer who was one of the king of torts, if you will, that John Grisham writes about. And he, I mean, he taught me a lot. I read every deposition he'd ever done. Uh, every opening statement, closing argument, anything like that. And he used a version of the liar's loop, but for sometimes different purposes. So he wanted mm. the person to lie. And he had to mm. find, how do I get them to lie? How do I get them to tell this particular lie? Because if they lie in this particular way, I have my trial open and shut. Uh, it was famously done in a case that I saw where he used a, he basically blamed a school bus driver for an accident that the school bus driver had nothing to do with that didn't violate the rules. So, but that was where all the insurance was. Mm -hmm. So the key was he had to blame and he got the, but the school bus driver had lied about something that day. And, but the thing was, it was an inconsequential lie. It only mattered if he could get the, to do what you're talking about, to defend the lie would, would create the negligent standard that otherwise didn't exist. So he got the guy to repeat the lie. Then he got him to defend the lie. And by defending the lie, he created liability that didn't exist before that guy needed to defend the lie. And it was, I mean, he took a case that had zero value to 10 million plus. It was, it was brilliant work. Well, and you can, a false confession is the easiest thing in the world to get because pressure, pressure, release, pressure, pressure, release. Mm -hmm. And the only way I would ever use a false confession is exactly like you're talking about. I'd say, look, I got your confession here. I'll tear it up if you tell me what you actually did do. Right. Uh, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's uh, so yeah. The, the all of the techniques that uh, that the both the panel does and that the workshops do are universally valuable. Uh, you know, the uh, you can even figure out whether Viva's kid is lying when he's saying, "Daddy locked me in the house all day and he didn't take me to the park. He didn't do these five things." <laughs> yeah, he may have video footage, but it's all lie, Ma. I can tell you, I know when my kids are lying when they say I don't remember because they know better than to lie. And I don't remember is the best thing they can say without lying. But I know they're lying when they say it because I know they remember darn well what they just did. <laughs> yep. Hey, let's let's talk for a second about the difference in you and you, in you two, because there's a big difference in your styles. Oh, you yeah, know, for, sure. for example, I would see if if I was going to differentiate, if I was explaining that if I was going to differentiate you two and, when I was talking to someone. I would, I would, I would take the stance of Viva is more like a police dog when they're on you and they're chasing you. And once they get on you, that you're done. That's it. That once they get, and at the same time, a Doberman friend who's like loose comes around, starts chewing you all over the place where one snags you and the other one just, just bites all over you. And there was Barnes is more like a, uh, a cross between like a gorilla and the strong man at the, at the circus <laughs> where you just walk up and go, paint your head off and then there you'd be so it's one of those and set you wherever you want to set you that's the way i see those in in your your um approach to whatever situation you're dealing with because i wouldn't want to do either one of them they're both horrible horrifying uh you know approaches toward someone if you're approaching somebody like that's no problem but if somebody's approaching you like that it's horrifying well that's no, why I'm, from a prosecutorial perspective uh eric interviewed uh uh Erica Baker, I'm going to get her name wrong. Erica Baker, I just blanked. Uh, what was the uh, former prosecutor you talked to who now does all the Toddy Westbrook stuff? Emily Baker. Emily, Emily Baker. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was because your name's Eric. She's Emily. I can find it. Created Erica, but uh, that's where you know n names. Unless I memorize them, boom, they're gone. Mm -hmm. The uh, 
but yeah, but the but like she is a very effective prosecutor. She'd be the kind of prosecutor I would negotiate with, not go to trial with, because she comes at like Viva comes across very nice. But if you understand their personalities, they can be very ruthless. And that's a very dangerous pro lawyer on the other side to have to She's deal with. She's 22. That makes her even deadlier. Because the jurors will want to like them while they mm -hmm. hang your client. They'll, they'll hang your client and, <laughs> it, it, like, it, with, a, with a smile. Uh, so that that's like, yeah. don't ever go against a uh, former, like Shannon Breen, former pageant winner, but also a uh, then became a journalist, but a lawyer in between. She would be a brutal lawyer. Because she's these nice, sweet Southern. It's you just got to cut off their heads now, everybody. You just you just got to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 the jurors would be like, okay, those are the lawyers you got to watch out for. It's an what interesting thing because I I would have friction with judges because typically judges are older men, and when they see a young you know a young confident kid come in, the first reaction that they have is cocky, arrogant prick, and <laughs> respond badly to that. And I did have difficulty changing my behavior to cater to the the pride of older judges and and it would and especially also having a father who was well known in litigation there was already some baggage that they were imposing on me but I, I was bad at changing my behavior um and in deposition it's you know I can I can change my behavior but it's not all not always smiles in deposition you know Viva I would tell you that when I was a soldier I was probably not the best soldier. I was damn good at what I did. I mean, I, I liked the army. I didn't love the army. I loved what I did for a living. And an old warrant officer said to me one time, your competence hides a multitude of sins. <laughs> I'll never forget <laughs> that. <laughs> yes, I, no doubt. I consider but that I, a compliment. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I remember in law school, uh, I was part of the Innocence Project. And the law, they're all lefty professors, but they uh, really did not like the poli well, the what my client was accused, or what our client, the Innocent Project client, was accused of, but it looked to me like legally he wasn't guilty of it. And so I got into arguments, contesting it, challenging it, so on and so forth. And I remember once this younger old lefty professor looked at me with just shock uh, when we were in a debate and discussion about it. And he said, my God, you just have no respect for authority. And I was like, yeah, yeah I don't know. why is that news? Why is that bad? Uh, just because of the way in which they're used to it. But in dealing with judges and dealing with other people, you have to, it's a different kind of than interrogation or deposition or witness examination. It's a different kind of disguise that you need to right. wear. Uh, but you often have to be this guy. You can't, you know, there's very few judges where you can just be yourself and make your own argument straightforwardly. And that work well for you. You have to blend in, try to, you know, try to adjust, try to accommodate. Uh, I learned early on, Coming across as the smartest lawyer in the room was you had to be very careful with that. Mm. With the judges, you, then you're smarter than the judge. That's a problem, right? Well, the, uh, that part doesn't matter. Cause sometimes that's just true. But the uh, what, <laughs> what, what 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 it becomes a problem is that when the judge is uh, emotionally insecure about that fact, then now there's ways uh, you can manipulate it uh, if you do it right. You you, you want to come across as smarter than the judge without offending, upsetting, or triggering the judge. And so it's this balancing act well, that what Dave is talking about. You want to make the judge feel or smarter the judge. when the judge That's decides why they need to uh, agree with you. So, like, exactly. it, it, it's flattering the judge so the judge says, oh, I'm so smart now, I understand what Robert is saying. Because yeah, a lot of lawyers <laughs> can't handle good argument. I mean, the uh, I won't uh, name any, but like Eric earlier in the year wanted me to debate some people. And I was like, uh, that's not going to go well. They're not going to respond well. That If I'm passionate about something, I'm not going to hold back. And I learned this in law school. Like, you know, we have everybody's asking everybody questions and you raise hands. Yeah. Uh, I was good at giving those answers. But what it did is it destabilized not only the confidence, but there are people who went to law school who they their, who they were as human beings was good lawyers or was going to be good lawyers. And consequently, if someone shook that or questioned that, uh, even in indirectly, unintentionally, it shook them as human beings. And like, man, there were people that were, there are people that are still mad at me from law school. And I'm like, uh, just because of how I answered a question, just I didn't mean to rattle them, but uh, had that effect. And so, for certain personalities, you have to be real careful. And frankly, particularly state court judges, but a lot of judges are the same way because they're a lot of them are insecure down deep when you dig into their psychology. They're not the best, most healthy. Like I always said, if you ask me who would I let babysit my kids, there's very few judges who would make that list. <laughs> uh, and, the, uh, and, and the rest. And none and of them would be picked by the Federalist Society. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, that they're the worst. But a lot of judges, <laughs> it's it's like my theory of the, like your bad cops are, are a lot like your bad criminals. They almost have the same personality. It's why some of them maybe are most effective. Hunter Thompson described this well in, in Hell's Angels, how a lot mm. of the police and the Hell's Angels that were at war with each other were really a lot like each other in psychological constitution. Mm -hmm. um, I've always said that judges understand criminals because a lot of them are natural criminals. They just went the authority route. I used to work with an old, 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 old warrant officer from Vietnam era, and he always said that all we are, all good interrogators are, is bastard cousins of, of um, prisoners because we have to understand how they think, how they work, and how they operate. And I, I say what made me a much better interrogator was locking me up for a week in Sears school because I understood the psyche of people. And one of the biggest problems, and I think we try to hit that in this in this course is if you can't think like that guy, you can't interrogate that guy. I, I pissed well, off right. some guys of in my day. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, I pissed off some guys in my day by saying, if you can't see the genius and I'm going to say this and somebody's going to blow up over it. If you can't see the genius in terror attacks, how you can take four people and kill mm. thousands, you can't interrogate the guy because it doesn't mean that he's a good guy. It means that you still need to understand how much genius it takes to do that. So yeah, Scott, you want to hit this? You've, yeah, these are the uh, the, the nine uh, modules we have. In our things, we say we have 30 videos. We I don't know how many videos there are. Yeah. There are over 65, I think, at this point. But, yeah, I was curious about that. Was, when I was going yeah. through there, I was like, there looks, uh, there's more than 30. They're short. Yeah. Yeah, many. Yeah, they're real short. But they, we put, there are modules, but as you know, in between those modules, we have other other modules about the, you know reviewing things or b extra body language you need to know because if you just went straight down this thing you wouldn't have all the information you need so we've we, we've got modules in between these modules so we start the whole thing out with the, the 911 call that's usually in a true crime situation that's usually where where they all start anyway is with the 911 call so we talk about what happens there and 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 what to listen for and what's usually said what's usually what what's missing when they're the the uh, usually end up being the suspect or what is correct when they're uh, sure. usually the suspect or what's too much. And well, then you yeah. have to just get, I was just going to say, yeah. you guys did a great behavior. Was it you guys that did the behavior language breakdown of the John Bonet Ramsey's mother's 911 call? Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That was yeah. the most interesting 911 call analysis I'd seen. That was fascinating. Just well, there's studies. We, we cite a couple of studies where you content and whether they're telling you a story or trying to get help are good indicators. There's actually a study by a couple of, and I'll find the link and give it to you, Eric, but there's actually a study by a couple of psychologists who, and AI will help with this long-term, who can tell by the content of the call. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, statement now. Yeah, that makes sense. And yep. you, you, the one that really chilled me in the course is you have one from Hans Walters. That was chilling. Who's the uh, former lieutenant? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it is. You don't normally hear somebody say, I just shot my wife in the head and killed my son. And he's confessing, yeah. but he is so calm because he does it's this for flat. a living every day, right? It's, I mean, he deals with trauma every day. And that's one of the points we bring up. If you ask a person who deals with trauma every day, they're going to deal with giving you facts differently than a person who has just for the first time found someone who's dead. And we put this thing together, Scott. Uh, I, we were watching, uh, I watched a bunch of true crime with my wife who loves true crime and I hated it. And we started doing the behavior panel. I'm the guy who finds videos. So all I do on Sunday mornings is watch murder stuff and horrible <laughs> stuff that I really don't want to see. Scott will call and say, are you okay? Uh Thank you. Definitely be good. Don't watch the AOC video because that oh. was deep, deeply traumatizing what she had to go through. That was just shocking. That would be, that'd probably be one of your most all time viewed if you guys break down the oh, AOC. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be yeah. fun. Yeah, so, it, so my wife, my wife <laughs> loved this video. And so I started watching this thing and, and I started noticing a formula with this stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I, we put together that formula and it became a storyboard we based the course on. So you'll see as we ah. go back into that thing. Yeah. It, I think for us, it was more of a, hey, if you watch and you take this approach, you'll be able to tell pretty early who committed the crime in, that, in these shows. Yeah. And in the show, in these shows, you'll be able to see where you are in the in the modules or in the in the course. You'll say, oh, I'm, I know what this is. I understand they're feeling threatened now. They're realizing the threat yep. from the investigators or the detectives. I know what's going to happen next. And you'll watch the same scenario. These same scenarios play out during those. And you'll move along and say, oh, Lord, I know what's happening here from each of the modules, because in every one of these shows and in true life as well, it's almost a protocol that happens as it goes through. There. When you guys who deal with criminal activity all the time, you, you know it, you, you hear the person telling a story when they first come in, for example, or finding the body's a team sport. They don't want to be alone when they find the person, that kind of thing. You find that 
then the recognizing the threat, then when we get into the body language and things that everybody want to hear about from our behavior panel days and those kinds of things. But even down to we walk through the process of how you get to an interrogation because, or how you get to a confession, because once you get to where you're recognizing the threat, now everything ramps up, all that body language comes up and all of our tools come on the, on the line, all the things that we use to earn trust and get the person talking. And then once that happens, there's a formula, there's a, a pattern and we can pick up on what is a real confession. Matter of fact, those of you defending people, we can almost pick up false confessions from body language because there's so much body language wrapped up in it that you can see it. I just want to say I I've been I am seeing the chat. I'm seeing a lot of the comments. One of the discussions um, that well, the, the, one of the realities about the AOC, everybody wants to you know have a break. Yeah, well, I've had a super chat and everything else, and I <laughs> I can probably promise it's not going to happen, just simply because they don't need to be accused of victimizing a victim after the fact. I will give. I'll give uh, she's been through so so much. So, well, so you know. I'll give Tim Pool credit because he was sort of remorseless in his attack this afternoon, breaking down why he objectively believes she lied. But this is the nature when you politicize everything. You can you can't have a discussion that would be an honest breakdown of the facts and the body tells without it regressing into undermining every aspect of victimhood that uh, AOC has alleged. And there's no way to do an objective analysis without looking like a victimizer. So this one is probably just going to be politically too hot a potato for anybody to, to, to delve into. But it does bring up in general, Robert, we will undoubtedly have seen it um, when people when people get caught and how they try to backtrack in a way that is not always backtracking, but pushing forward, but bringing other stuff in to sort of distract from where they just got caught. That's called defending, right? In the liar's loop? It's called chaff and redirect, sort of. <laughs> in, yeah, that's, that's a style. That's what, yeah, but once yeah. you get the person to that point, they're going to use all these tools they have. And, then, you know, guys, we really go out of our way not to be political. I mean, I certainly have my political leanings. And, you know, in a different arena, I certainly have what I believe. Trust me. But we try really hard not to be political in our approach. And I agree with you, Viva. We got to be cautious with how we approach things. If If I look like I look... And I mm. say, and people are going to jump all over. Right. I've been accused of you name it, horrible names because I disagree with somebody who didn't look like me, or because I interrogated people in the Middle East, or I interrogated wherever. You know, I'm I'm, I'm a monster, and I would say to people, guys, this is not. You can make all this out to be whatever you want, or I'm biased because. I spent much of my life learning to take away as much bias as possible. Now, is it possible to take all bias away? No, absolutely not. That's what human beings are. But every time I said this earlier, if you can't see the genius in the 9-11 attacks, you can't interrogate the guys who did it. You can't. You have to be able to see points of view of people other than yourself to be any good at what I do. And no, I spent a lot of years doing that. I, I, it's just the nature like of identity politics, which is you go after the individual and not the and not the argument, which is all that these arguments are, especially on Twitter, where you can rally a mob in no time at all. But in fact, I'm curious about all three, uh, Eric not, Eric Hunley, not to exclude you, just from the experience of Greg. Oh, no, no, you exclude Art, me. <laughs> the, what, what do you all think of the old uh, cliche that if they're crying, they're lying? Like I, when when I do when I did depositions, I know whenever someone started crying, it's because they got caught in a lie. But I'm curious to know, you know, in the harder core depositions, interrogations, is that rule? Well, you could. Yeah, there, there are a couple of different ways to look at it. There's something called, we have a thing called strip and we, and it, it goes through the different types of um, approaches someone will take to keep from, from getting in trouble. And one of them is called trancer. And so a lot of times that the, the trancer, and that's the person who is, they really want to avoid uh, an encounter with you know, the encounter with the, uh, mm -hmm person who's see if they're if they're lying or not so they'll be crying out of control they'll be rocking back and forth and they'll be giving you um you know they'll, they'll be maybe oh my baby my baby those types of things that's the hardcore stuff where they're trying to to um just, it, it, just, pre it prevents you from being able to connect with them so they're using yeah. that as a tool maybe i'll Wasn't tell you your video today um when you were talking about the snake that um the guy from uh robin hood was doing the transfer thing a yeah, little he was bit. rocking, and he was uh, what I was talking about. He's doing something I call the chained elephant in the chair. You know, he's just doing. No, yeah. Scott was talking about him doing that kind of nodding oh, with but that. The, that oh, the was from hypnotized. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that was that was that was something completely different. That was that wasn't this at all. So, so yeah. Viva, the, the first thing I ever learned about body language in my entire life, I was working at Sear and people would break down and cry. And these are these are not men who cry. It's just a game for them. And they would break down and cry when I asked about their parents. We would ask them about their families. And to the person, almost all of them would say, my parents died when I was eight years old in a car crash. And I was like, what? does SF like raid orphanages or something here? So I went in and asked the psych. And he said, look, he's using this, a part of his brain to cry. He's remembering something emotional. Ramp up the pressure. If it's real, he's, he'll cry a lot harder. If it's not real, the tears will dry up. First thing I ever learned about body language. So hmm. if that gives you any help, next time ramp up the pressure. If they keep crying, it's real. If they don't, then it's not. I'll, have, the, I'll have to experiment on children before I can go back into a deposition. <laughs> one of my, one of my e easiest targets these days. <laughs> well, you have a pack at home and you can experiment on them, right? No. <laughs> but but no. what Scott's talking about with the transfer is anytime somebody finds a way to create something that separates them from you. And it's one of five strategies we put together. We could come up with dozens, but the five that are easiest to remember are stancer as God is my witness, getting angry and blowing away so you can't talk to them. Trancer, that person who's rocking back and forth and doing something and crying and getting away. Insulator, I just pour out so much crap that you can't get through it. Chaff and redirect. I just keep mm -hmm. dumping data and you can't get to me because of it. And then finally, Prancer, and that's the person who's showboating and there's just so much larger in life and their story is, you know, they're, they're looking for their they're close up. They're just big, big, big story. And you guys see that a lot when you're dealing with criminal cases. I think as attorneys, you see people, they've created the whole story and they've tied it all together and they got to give you all the details. And what we try to get across in this true crime workshop is that starts with a 911 call. They start control release of their story, framing the story so that by the time they get to you, of course, their story is believable. They've been working it for that entire time. They've been like doing that, that liar's loop. Like that lady that whacked her husband. Oh, uh, love that one. One of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. that was. Yeah. That was I mean, that was that was fascinating. The I mean, my theory oh, of AOC working out the Super Bowl. One. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. he, he was watching the football game. She really loved him. Then he died. And she nine one one call. I loved him, and he loved me. That's one of the oddest yeah. I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. she she keeps talking about how she was in the gym and the music was blasting, and she just came in. If he'd been shot like forty feet away, not forty feet, it was like sixteen yeah. feet away from, and she didn't hear it. Yeah. And the, and this gym she was in was like the laundry room that had a little weight bench in it and this little tune box up there that was supposed to be blasting. You couldn't hear a thirty eight from there. Well, then anybody you know who works. So, Viva, how long were you on the treadmill today, or on the on the wherever you were exercising? You probably know, right? If I exactly. ask you a question, so, so thirty five minutes with the five minute cool down, four point five seven miles at a one degree incline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. You get what I mean. This woman didn't remember how long she'd been exercising uh, or any of that. So she she had a, it was 4.30 or 5 when I came in. What time did you go to the gym? Uh, you know, those kinds of questions just stand out. But these, so these are the bad ones, but then who are the good ones who, I mean, I guess the really good ones, you're not going to know because they're going to have gotten away with it. Well, some, some people are good enough liars that they convince with help, they convince the jury that they're not telling a lie because most people in juries, I think, have the same problem that the rest of us have. We project and want to believe. I think I told you guys last time I was on here, I was on a plane with a guy who was an attorney who was talking about body language. He told me he saw this woman, he was pretty sure he had gotten through to her and she was crying. And when they found his guy guilty of murder, she, he asked her, I thought I got through to you. She said, no, I was just wondering how you could how you could defend that guy as a reason she was crying. <laughs> so at, at the end of the day, we project all of us project, and I think we'll project onto some person because they remind us of another person or those kinds of things. Yeah, speaking That's of which, like what AOC's routine reminded me of was one of the things you guys get into in the workshops uh, and another analysis, which is transference. And I found that to often be a very effective way for people to lie. Like one of the harder lies I have unraveling is when someone has transferred somebody else's story into their own. Like someone like AOC... Mm -hmm. Not requiring you guys comment on her, but theoretically speaking, she may be someone who has heard a lot of victim stories as someone who's, who's given her job as a bartender and then as a congresswoman. And so and being part of that whole narcissistic selfie subculture that makes the victim the ultimate hero these days that uh, that you that the most effective way to retell a victim story is to tell somebody else's story is your own. And then the because then you're in their state of mind, you might be less likely to lie, less likely to to uh, do an identifiable lie. But what, what's your guys' analysis on how to take apart someone who's doing transference as their method of lying? Hmm. 
Scott, you want to start? Greg. Yeah, this, yeah. These, so are just, these are like right down your right down your thing there. Go ahead. So transference is one of my favorites because it is probably the hardest to break. And often they tie it and, and make you feel guilty for attacking it. Most transference lies are going to be war heroes, you know, assault victims, all kinds of stuff like that that people tie together because you will not attack it. And you want to ask, hey, who knew about that? Why didn't you tell anybody back then? Those kinds of questions that you would normally do to start unraveling it from their storybook to take it out of their photo album and say, this picture looks like it doesn't fit the rest of them. Why? They, they insulate themselves so that you can't. And that's the whole insulator thing, right? I'm wrapping myself in, in something holy that you can't attack. And that makes it very tough for you to go after them. Is, that the, tell, is that the tell itself that you're looking for something oh, yeah. that you're yes. not able to attack at all, that if they're truthful, maybe they leave a little bit more room in there, but if they put up such a strong barrier yes. that maybe there's some sort of deception? So for me, for example, nobody's going to claim I was a Waffle House dishwasher. That's just not the transference they're going to do, right? But they are going to do mm -hmm. something that you will feel sorry for, you will feel obligated to. It's a reason you see these knuckleheads who do the stolen valor thing. And all of us want to believe in greatness and people doing good things. And only, and some of these guys are good. I mean, they they go and research and know which metals and all that. To wear. Some of them are knuckleheads and wear stuff that looks like, you know, something off of, like there's somebody out of a you know, third world country with shit down the sides of their legs and stuff. But some of them get it right and they learn the right language and they do all that. And it only, it takes real guys to go after them who are, who can, and you can, if you're a combat veteran, you can go after that person. On the other hand, if you're not and you're attacking them for being a combat veteran, then they can say, oh, yeah, 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 tough guy, and go after you and do that. And it happens all the time. Okay, on that, on that note, um, the ability to go after them, I thought about it earlier, and who could question. Perhaps somebody to evaluate AOC would be somebody like Lena Sisko, a, um, another attractive female who interrogated the Taliban. And it'd be harder to accuse her of just going after or attacking a victim or anything else when she's Look, I hadn't, I hadn't always been an old white guy. I was a young white guy once, but I can't change fact. I'm an old white guy and it took me a thousand years to get this experience and it works. But I have to be cautious that I don't come across as attacking because I'm an old white guy. And that's the piece that you got to get. I can't change what brought me here. It certainly was not that I was born into something because I can tell you I lived in absolute poverty as a kid. That's why I joined the army. My wife lived in a mud house until she was 10. I mean, we just, it is what it is. I can't change how I got here, but I can share with you what I know. And you're right. We got to go to other people. Most of the interrogators I worked with in my military career didn't look like me, oddly enough. <laughs> they were, they were native speakers of Spanish, Arabic, mm. other languages. So they didn't look like me. My world was was not a white world. It was not a lily white world that people want to perceive it to be. It was a it was a varied world because people come to the field to support the American cause, and they're often native speakers in the cultures they're going back to interrogate. So it's go well, after those guys you get, then they can say things in a different way. Well, well the thing is, the genius of the true crime workshop uh, is that you can apply that same logic yourself. You yourself could, uh, right. anybody out there that's part of the audience. And listen to what Greg said earlier in breaking down transference and the rest and see if it applies to a certain famous congresswoman uh, and see how much it might apply. Uh, so much so that probably tomorrow she'll say that her father, she was born in poverty and her spouse uh, li lived in a mud house. And you'll see different versions of that transference take place because I think she's uniquely capable of it, that not ascribing my beliefs to anyone else on the panel, lest they be subject to uh, any kind of criticism. But the utility to doing the workshop is people can become self-educated, self-informed and apply it themselves. You're not going to get to the level that Greg and Scott or uh, Tan Daddy Chase or the others are at uh, <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, uh, or, or Mark. But you can you can apply it to a much better level than your amateur or your average person or a lot of people who claim to be experts who frankly are not. So that's the utility to the workshop is to be self-educated, self-informed. Whole right. point of Eric's Unstructured Podcast to introduce you to people to help you do that. Whole point of what Viva and I do uh, is that you're empowered by self-information, self-education. Make your own choices. You could come to your own conclusion that maybe the victim experience that she describes is an authentic one and not stolen victimhood. Uh, or, or stolen valor as stolen victimhood in the modern age, uh, or draw a contrary conclusion. But it, it's the utility of you need the skills and the tools to be able to at least do an above average analysis. You know, when I stand in front of corporate folks, they'll say, you know, whatever you say, I believe. I don't know if it's true or not. And I'll always say, those are your tax dollars at work.
That's exactly <laughs> what it is, right? Yeah. Oh, this is a lot of years of, and, and I always say, I, I'm the luckiest guy you'll ever meet. You know, I could have ended up living right where I started instead of getting to where I've gotten, and, and I've been very lucky. But being exposed to all that stuff and all those places, it gives us an opportunity to bring you something that you're not going to be exposed to otherwise. And it's kind of lifting a curtain. And so thanks for that. I do think you can learn from this stuff and apply it just as maybe not to the same degree, but you've got a different skill set than I have in your daily job and in your life that you can also turn those skills on critiquing whether the person is telling the truth or not. Attorneys have a different skill set than business people, than doctors. Well, it's well, universally useful because, uh, uh, sorry, Viva, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in the sense that not only for a legal profession, but your everyday life, your kids, your family, public, various forms of interaction that you, you're going to have to use some degrees of these skill sets that might become applicable, but particularly in your professional and business and occupational life, dealing with a customer, dealing with a creditor, dealing with a contractor, you name it, where it's helpful to be able to have the tools necessary to be able to assess the information, at least above average compared to uh, the ordinary person who often is, as you know, uh, is projecting their own beliefs and ideas onto the case, onto the situation, onto the circumstance, and thus draw bad conclusions and incorrect judgments that harm everybody in the process, not just police officers and the rest. Though I highly recommend it for police officers. Uh, the, 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 their chances of being effectively cross-examined will go down if they uh, are using the techniques that uh, Greg and Scott uh, employ. And, and Robert and I, now I think we're on the same wavelength officially, because I was just going to say the exact same thing. It's, it's not a question of taking it to find criminals, but, you know, cross-examining your children's boyfriends or girlfriends or con just when you talk <laughs> with someone to, to know if a contractor is full of crap or if they genuinely know yes. what they're doing mm -hmm. just by asking a few questions and seeing how they respond, how they divert or how they stay on point. The, the one thing, the, the transference, it, there's are there two types of transference? Because you have the transference where stolen valor outright or you have the transference, what I would call it maybe confusion of the fabricated trauma with an actual historical trauma, which makes it easier for the liar to lie mm -hmm. about the current trauma by melding it with an actual past experience. So what, do you, what would you call that type of um, yeah. misleading? Scott, uh, I'll no, let you. Go ahead, it. Greg. No, you're on a roll, man. Have at Memory. Go ahead. We, we talked about this last time we talked, Viva. Memory is a, is a subjective thing, right? So if what we do is we fill in the blanks, it's human nature. And if I, if I can't remember, let's say something actually happens to someone and they're trying to remember the details, the more cases they read, the more likely they are to contaminate. Every time you bring up a memory, you edit it. It's just a fact. Because otherwise, if I ask you where you lived and you start talking about your childhood and when you were five, you're going to remember that house and all that through your modern eyes but you're also gonna think about it in childlike terms. So you, the house is gonna have a different size than it would have, but you're gonna remember it kind of like you remember now. So every time you edit something, every time you take it open and you edit it, you're also using modern knowledge. So the more stuff you read, the more you pollute. For that matter, in my days interrogating prisoners, we always made a point of separating them and silencing them because otherwise they contaminate each other's stories. I'll tell you, if you ask me to tell you a war story, I'll tell you a war story and I'll say how much of that's true. And I'll say 80% probably because it's been 30 years and I was in a war. And so I don't know how much I've polluted my own thoughts with other people's stories. And if you can't understand that, then you get in a bind. And sometimes people are not intentionally doing it. They're just putting details in places where they don't yeah. have them. So that I'm transference gonna, makes it really hard to your point. I'm going to steal that. It's a, that memory is a, is a selectively edited film. Uh, and exactly. that explains a lot of false confession. I mean, confessions, the, one of the least reliable forms of testimony, uh, when in terms of historically, when a case is set aside, false confessions are at the top. And for the other going to that false eyewitness testimony, where people really think they saw something and they just edited something that day in their brain, their memory as to what happened. And that's why like how they do lineups are critical. I mean, yeah. we used to do lineups where it was obvious the, you know, the, okay, so she said he was African-American and five foot 10. Let's bring in the one guy we think is guilty. who's African-American and five white guys. Uh, see sure. what yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, that'll work. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's how it became. I still think that violates the fifth amendment because you're being forced to use your body against yourself. And I, I'm not, uh, mm. justice Thomas agrees with me, but no one else yet has, unfortunately, but the, uh, uh, but that's the you know, whole scale of it. But yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Hey, hey this Eric, is on point. Um, Scott, I'm going to go to you on this, but yeah. um, can Scott and Greg be just as effective? And I think this actually goes in with a 911 call on the course. Uh, can you be just as effective if you only have access to someone via audio, telephone, et cetera, versus being face-to-face? -face? 
it's a different approach. It's a real different pl- approach because you can't see them. And it's what they say. You can hear the changes in their in their voice tone. You can hear the, the differences in how their vernacular changes, whether they speed up or slow down as you continue to talk. You can tell if they're taking extra time to, to think. And you can tell when their words start getting big gaps in them, if there's, they're not sure what they're going to say like that. You can tell a whole lot from that, but I, I'm, I'm not a, a big advocate of that. I don't, I don't feel like you can do as, as good a job at all because you can't see the person. They can't see you, how you're reacting, whether you believe that person or not. And that's a very important part of it is, is that person's reaction to your reactions. If you act as though you don't believe them and you just sit there and pause after they answer, then they're going to start talking again. But not only that, that happens on the phone, but in person, you're going to get to, you get to see them lock in on you and see what they do while they're waiting. Are they writing something down? Are they looking around the room? Are they talking to somebody? Are you doing that? And that's because that's why there's a pause. Why is the pause there? So you really can't see what's happening, but there's, but some people are great at it. Some people are really good at it. But for me personally, and no. And I like if I have nothing but auditory cues, I can work from that because I work from cadence, choice of words, pitch, and tone. And those pieces matter. It's when you add all the body language in that you get a much better picture. But if you can take into account that a person normally speaks at this speed, and as they get into a topic, they slow down, they're navigating something. They're navigating mm-hmm. something. Or if they finish answering your question and speed up to get away from it, that also means something. And what we're looking for is not that it means they're lying. We're looking for a baseline deviation. All that we do is baseline deviation in facial expressions, in eye blink rates, in all kinds of other things. So what Scott's saying is you lose, you know, 50, 60 percent of your cues. So you have to pay more attention to those other things like pitch, cadence, tone, diction, and it gets harder. You have to pay really good attention then. Do you ever go back to the tape? I'm curious about that because like, I understand you're having to catch all this live and obviously the more information you could see live is cool, right. but do you ever have it where, let me say you're talking to somebody for an hour or two and then you just leave and then you go watch yeah. your own performance and them after the fact and maybe close your eyes and just listen or turn down the volume and just watch or do you do any of that out of curiosity? Yeah. Yeah, you do that. You, you get as much information as you possibly can. If you're talking to someone and you can get up and leave and listen, that you know, at you give the signal so they see you through the through the camera and they come in and they give a little knock and you, yeah, we need you out here for a minute or we have found something else. Then you can leave and go watch them as you're talking to them just to make sure you you're going down the right road from the body language you've you've been observing and the decisions you've been making up to that point. Now it's tough to do because you know on a timeline you've got you know. A certain amount of time you can keep somebody in those things. So it's not going to happen very often. But um, Greg and I have talked about it, uh, one or two where I, I've act, actually do that, which we won't get into here. We can't. But 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 that that well, I was glad that I did. So. Well, and it's a team sport, guys. If you're like in my old world back in my Army days, we would have more than one interrogator on site unless you're forward deployed and out in the middle of nowhere. And we have other people watching to give you cues. Say, hey, I noticed this. Did you notice that? Because you're also engaged. Remember that Jung said, you know, no two people can interact without affecting each other. So you're Mm -hmm. impacted by that person, too, because all your mirror neurons are going and all that when you're sitting across from them. So sometimes other people will see things you don't see because they're outside of the of the engagement. And that's the the perfect person or the perfect style or type of person to have watch those is a woman because they Mm. see so much more than than men see. Their brains are set up to take information a lot in a lot more detail, a lot more of it than we are. That's not just me saying that. that that's that's a fact. We know that's for sure. The way the brain, the the difference in the in, in the way the brains are set up. And if you get a woman to watch, you make them out there going, "Well, it looks you know looks good to me." What do you think? If something's up, they'll always say, "You know, something's bugging me about that." Where you ask him about where he was between yeah. here and there. I know you went in. He said, and then we went to, and you got into that. Did your the micro interview in there, but there's something not right about that. Then you go, don't go, okay, yeah, you're probably right. I always go, oh, okay, hang on, I'll be right back. And then you go visit that again because lots of times you'll you'll flip up something where they'll see stuff that you won't. And that happen that'll happen quite often. And you don't tell her, you don't tell her to go in and say, watch this and see what you think. So you observe this as I'm doing it. Yeah, okay, it's no problem. And they'll watch. 
but just that without having to focus, you know, without saying, oh, he wants me to watch this because I'm a woman. I can do it good. You can't go down that road. Just say, watch this, observe this while I'm doing it. Just saw it. Yeah, okay. That's when you get a lot from the from a, from a woman because they they collect a lot more information than we do. As cool and as powerful as we think our brains are as men. They, yeah, they, yeah. They've got that. My analogy to that is if you think your brain is much more detail than any woman try to clean up the bathroom and then go say, Hey, I cleaned the bathroom. <laughs> well, you know, guys, well, yeah. well, you yeah. deal with the AOC issue. Cause I think that might be less controversial than this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just a difference in, you know, I think what Scott's point is, is people's brains are wired differently and whatever it is. Like I always chose a woman as an interrogation partner, primarily for that reason, because it's another way of looking at the world and the way is now one of my favorite, and I can't mention names because these people might get in a bind at some point. But one of my favorites was a very tough minded Dominican woman. And she was one of the most aggressive interrogators ever worked with in my life. And because she was so aggressive, I would forget how much she was intaking. And when mm. it's over, I would think, okay, I saw this. And she'd go, oh, did you see this and this and this and this and this? Although she was very aggressive at the time. So I think personality yeah. plays a huge part too. But having as many different kinds of eyes on something as you possibly can is important when you're interrogating. Here's an interesting one. Um, what if you're interrogating a blind person? Have either of you? I, I haven't. That's one I haven't. I never have, but I, I grew up with one in a way. My my dad's best friend was was Doc Watson, the guitar player. And he was around all the time. We were around him all the time. And their their behaviors are a lot different than ours as far as body language goes, because their expressions, of course, are different. For example, if if you were to tell um, Doc a joke, this guy, Doc Watson, joke, and, he, and he, he may pretend it was funny and he may laugh. But soon after that, he would smile and he would go. And his face would go back to what felt normal to him, but it may look like he's being mean or uninterested to anyone mm. else simply because he doesn't know the social um, thing we have where we keep smiling anyway, you know, just to have a pleasant look on your face. So your resting face there makes makes a big difference in those situations. Plus the fact you know, I, I wouldn't want to because you're not going to see much in, in you'll see some things, the basics that, that Greg and I understand. We won't go into the, the minutia of that, but on a big scale, you're not going to see a whole lot. Mm. Yep. And, and, before we forget, Eric, can you get the Ryu Kirito, Ryu Kirito super chat from a while back where it says as a Marine, nothing gets me more mad than stolen valor. I'll swing at those types of people. So disrespectful to be my brothers and my sisters. And it's amazing. It's an interesting thing because I had this thought earlier today where there's a fundamental oh, yeah, that between stolen, stolen victimhood and stolen victimhood. Because when you when you steal valor, when someone it, when someone is attributed valor, if nobody believes them, as far as I'm concerned, it means less to them. They they know what they achieved. It doesn't matter if other people believe right. them. Yep. When it comes to victimhood, being believed is the most essential thing. And if you don't believe them, then you're depriving them basically of of the most important element to them. So stealing someone's valor is more of a selfish thing that's less of an attack on the person who's Agreed. a true power. But stealing victimhood undermines all other victims, which is, I think it's fundamentally even more disrespectful. Stolen valor is, I think, pathological, but stolen victimhood is, is pathological and fundamentally disrespectful to all actual victims out there, which is my afternoon revelation. Yeah. And I guess it's a great, a, great an care. anniversary for Jesse yeah. Smollett, right? I, I, Robert, what's going on? We are, we are going to have a stiff afternoon. <laughs> Robert, has there been any update in the FBI investigation into the envelopes? They, they had in a whole, didn't they investigate the powder in the envelopes as to whether or not it was a federal crime? Yeah, I haven't heard any update. I know part of a one A trial concerning, uh, as Dave Chappelle calls him, uh, I think uh, Juicy Smollett, uh, is that uh, uh, and, and uh, his whole comedic routine was fascinating. What I find comedians fascinating in general is they have to almost have this universal human experience they can uh, adapt to they can tap into that, mm -hmm. it, that in order for it to be comedically effective they have to have a certain deep uh, insight into some aspects of human nature uh it, it, to be consistently comedic i think it's why they're often makes some of our best dramatic actors are ex-comedians uh but that the and i think it's why it was easy for rogan to transition into podcasting because you had to have a broad interest and in, broad curiosity, broad area of you have to be conversant in a wide range of topics and subjects um, and the rest in order to do so. I mean, people uh, I, I mean, some people who get caught committing crime probably would be a lot more effective if they weren't so limited in their human experience. It's like uh, you guys were doing the who was that crazy L.A. guy 
that uh, that uh, he got transported to different places. Just really, really dark. Oh, you're talking about the the uh, UFO guy. Are Not the UFO about- guy. The, the guy that was the killer. They like and killed. Oh children. yeah, Richard Richard Ramirez. Ramirez. That yeah, yeah. guy. Yeah. Yep. Like you could tell. Like that guy was so inadequate in his conversational capabilities that he had to reread off scripts. That not only was he trying to imitate human beings and interacting with them to pretend he was one with a conscience. Yep. Though it was amazing how that that dark smile that he would come back to when he when you'd see the real side of who he was. I mean, that was one of the most ter- that guy was more terrifying than almost anybody I've seen interviewed. Like Charlie Manson, I always half wondered how much was Manson versus other yeah. people because sure. Manson just Same. doesn't give off the vibe that guy gives off. That guy is like yeah. danger, danger, danger. You know, yeah. and I, I've watched a lot of these. I've interrogated people. I've seen a lot of things. He's one of the people I like least of everything we've seen because a lot of these guys, you think, okay, they got a broken something in them, and they they may at least try to fight it, and then it comes out. I didn't get any of that from this guy's interview. It was just a game for him, and that's everything I got from the interview was. He just went on a rampage and he killed 14 people, I think is what he was charged with. And eventually with his cousin too, though, didn't he? That was a weird one as well, because very few serial killers work together. If I recall, he and his cousin killed some people I, together. I think somewhere early in the game, there was some of that. And then he had a spree though. And you know, the, the, you, you'll have people who defend him and say he didn't kill all those people. Okay, he oh, killed oh, six. Oh, okay, sorry. He only killed six. Okay, he killed 14 people or was 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 uh, charged and I think eventually sentenced for 14 people and then assaulted either sexually or, or violently, physically, some other way, um, 15 others. And they don't know how many, maybe he did other than that. And just, you could tell it was a game for this guy. It's just one of the worst I've ever seen. What about like Russell Williams? That guy I find so fascinating because of the military background. He probably has been through SEER school. Yes. Um, how would you address him? But just as an interesting, you know, parallel. To, I mean, Ramirez. I hate to say, he's very deeply creepy and all that, but he is a good Hollywood serial killer. Russell yep. Williams you, is somebody that you saw you would the perfect with your daughter. Yeah, but you you saw the the perfect approach to that guy in, in that interrogation, the guy yeah. who broke him. That was job. that was that will go down in the it, that'll that'll go down in history as one of the the best interrogations ever. Getting through all that, he did everything right. He did everything right, everything the way he sh- the way he should have. You're dealing with, with a psychopath, and he still made it all happen the way it should happen. It was it was beautiful. That was yeah. that was beautiful. And, and he clearly way, shows he clearly shows he'd been through seer school. I mean, I can watch him and tell you that. I'm not going to tell you how, but I can tell you by watching him that he had been through seer school. And I, I know the approaches to get around all that stuff. And he, the guy just knocked them right out of the park. He just walked him right in. And all he did was give him no choices over time and narrow him down to where he had him exactly where he needed to be. And then the guy, where was he going to go? But I agree with you, Scott. He had all the trappings of trust. You know, he's this yeah. Air Force colonel. He's in a position of authority. He's all those things. And, you know, they yeah. turned out to be a bad guy hiding in plain sight. Oh, and by the way, I, I, ha- I haven't mentioned it yet. Everybody should hit the like button because apparently there's 1,400 people watching and the like is only at wow. 475, give or take. And subscribe. Yeah. Please, because guess what, guys? It was demonetized the second it went up. <laughs> oh. There's no question. There's, there's, it's, they just have algorithms that are picking up words. The video on, on Mac. Yes, they are. Viva Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> my videos have been doing okay, but I today's video, which I haven't published yet, which is dealing with Maxine Waters' accusation of Trump that he should face charges for premeditated murder. They just they hear those words. We're talking, you know, crime shop. Yeah, Robert, what do you think about that? <laughs> do we do we talk about that Sunday? <laughs> that is insane. The, uh, yeah, yeah, it, we're we're getting to uh, definitely unique uh, places in space. You know, they took off the R and R. They demonetized R and R. Uh, Gruler, Robert Gruler, Gruler, oh, the whole the lawyer who was doing a lot of R and R legal group. I think uh, yep. started going on big last several months. Demonetized him out of the blue just because he's talking about controversial topics. It's oh, I think I, I even got questions on this. Do you guys have a Rumble channel as well? No, Eric keeps no, telling no. me to get one. Yeah, I know, and I have a reference link for you. So oh yeah, let's. Really, what is Rumble? Be nice. <laughs> it, it, it's a YouTube without censorship that doesn't yet have live stream capability, but it's about to. Doesn't about- yet have the audience, but it's going to in time. They don't do live stream, so they're perfect for it. Well, no, they're, they're going to have a live stream up sooner than later. I was talking to the CEO uh, privately, but it's also public. Um, and uh, for an example, by the way, the growth there, Alan Dershowitz 
opened up his channel two months ago. He's up at 107,000 subs. Wow. Wow. Nice. It, well, he gets more views on Rumble than he does on YouTube. It's, there is it's no very way. weird. Well, you, I, I can tell you why. It's algorithms. So, you know, like Viva would be well over uh, legal, legal by now, but for the algorithmic suppression since about August. Um, mm. And so that's what's going on. I mean, legal, legal, one of the dumbest human beings on the planet uh, is celebrated <laughs> as a lawyer. I mean, come it's, on. Uh, you I think it's like, that. <laughs> legal, legal couldn't survive two minutes with Greg, four minutes with Scott, five minutes with Viva, uh, 30 seconds with me. I would, uh, I would, <laughs> I would the guy's guy just not not bright. He's not, uh, uh, and yet YouTube is promoting him, and it's a little disconcerting because I hope they don't do it in spaces outside of politics. Uh, they're doing it some in culture, because at least then you, you can get honest sources for body language and stuff like that. Rather than because there's a lot of people out there that do body language analysis. Not oh not, yeah. Yeah. I've seen them all. They're, they're, like, they're doing it in everything. I'm not going to complain about any algorithmic suppression because I'm you know the channel's doing well and, and I can't complain. But they're doing it with other fields and they're doing it with fields of, of science and they're doing it with fields that there's you know it should true. only be people deciding what they want to watch and not algorithms. But I've got a kid who's don't play with any oh, don't play with any plugs. Well, I've got a, a super chat here. I, I have no idea. Richard Hopkins, USPS inspectors. Is this about election stuff, I don't know. It must be. I don't recognize that, Scott. Mm -hmm. You guys, I mean, the, okay. the, the oh, thing to uh, think about. Let me give you a quick way to know coercive versus the other piece. If the guy, if the interrogator is doing all the talking, and the guy's going, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, that's usually pushing, because yes mm -hmm. and no questions, dead in. Will have did are are bad questions in interrogation. I taught interrogation for years, and we had good and bad questions, compound questions. Did you do this or that? Those are questions we teach people not to use because they confuse the situation. We want narrative response. When I ask you a question, where were you on Tuesday, the sixteenth of January? That's then you have it to answer it, and then I take it apart instead of going and saying, "Okay, were you at this place on Tuesday, the sixteenth of January?" No. Then I'm trying to control the conversation. It's called a leading question, and that's oh, okay. key. That's like so universal. It's universal. It should be lo most lawyers fail to do it. A lot yep. of investigators fail to do it. Uh, forensic paralegals who do investigation in my space failed often fail to do it. Uh, journalists badly fail to do it. But of, often just in like contract everyday disputes with people, just get people to tell you their story. And that means open ended and 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 be uh, welcoming and not necessarily judging out of the gate. And you'll get tons and tons of information that will tell you what you really need. I'll teach I, you a dirty I, trick to argue. And, you know, I, I professionally argued for 20 years is what I would say. All you do is when someone's arguing with you, just nod and let them give you their entire argument. And then in the end, you just go tick, 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 and chop it up. Yes. It, you will know everything they're going to say before you start talking. But we always want to jump in and tell that person something so we don't do it. And for that reason, I've been called mean in arguments. So. <laughs> Well, what, just what, what, mean, period. what do you call it when somebody already knows what they're going to say and doesn't have the mental patience to sit there and listen to them say it? So they finish their sentence fast and they can say it and then they're called rude. Viva. <laughs> I think we're brothers. Viva. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see. We've got, um, we actually have a workshop here, folks. <laughs> and let's just kind of go over the general flow here because I mean it it is very cool and I I've, I've been through the 911 part which I think is pretty awesome and I feel like and maybe I'm wrong that they don't spend enough time on the 911 calls who doesn't I don't know if it's the shows or the cops and that's part of the problem too you're talking about true crime workshop so right I only have the narrative if I'm watching true crime oh. that is being presented to me by the director of okay. that particular program Oh yeah. Sometimes they will. Sometimes they won't. It depends on is whether it's they're sensationalizing, which is which most of it is. It depends on what's really going on. And a lot of these things, I don't think they're really out to solve the case. There's there's a, a bias toward whether the person is guilty or innocent, or they already know. So it'll be set up that way. So you can go back and say, see. But if you see these things raw and you hear these complete nine one one calls, we have a couple of uh, a couple of mine that are a little bit rough. Then. Mm. You'll you'll get the big you'll get the big picture, and a lot of times you can tell so much that's going on just from the call before anybody even shows up, you know. So that's and because they found the body or they've whatever. And we talk about that's that's module two. Where we talk about discovery of the victim, you know, who found it, how they found it. A lot of times you'll see, not every time, but quite often, someone will find the body. They'll say, "Let's go look. Come with me. My next door neighbor is I haven't heard from. Him. You go with me." 
Okay, I'll go with you. And they mm. find the, the other person. Well, well, this person does something else. The person they took with them will find the body. Then we go to the first interaction with the suspect. Who are the first people to show up? You've got first responders. You've got the paramedics. You've got the, the uh, first police officers to get there. And all the situation that what happens there, what body language they're looking for, the police officers anyway. And what kind of notes are they taking and why are they taking those types of notes? And 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 paying attention to what the paramedics are doing and what they're saying. Remember who's there, those types of things as you go through that. Then the first contact with the investigator, that tells the, the body language you talk about. That's where the strip thing we talked about earlier. And I left the R out of that. I left Romancer out. So it said step instead of strip. I know. I was wondering about that. Nah, I was sorry like, about hey, that. I'm going to be That's, classy. I, so, okay, I was in a hurry. That. I was um, in a hurry trying question to get that though, to you. Speaking of skipping, you um you skipped over first interaction with suspect. And this is one that I don't know if it's gonna trigger Barnes or not, because somebody shouldn't technically be a suspect, right? Until after you've talked to everybody. Or or I don't know how the law works. I, I just know there's some weird stuff there. So. Well, in true crime shows, they they pretty much yeah. let you know who the suspect is. Yeah. So that's 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 the that's the the form we're using like song form okay. they all have the same form and this is the form they use this is the structure in other words of all those things so yeah so that that's why we go through that yeah there's a lot that goes on once they've decided but the investigator shows up and he goes this might be it so everybody's a, a suspect when you first get there every because mm -hmm. you don't know what's going on yet you have no earthly idea everybody is or everyone, everyone can be at that point so greg why don't you go from five on yeah. So um, then we go realizing the threat. Again, when we hit realizing the threat, most people, if you go and watch these true crime shows, they're going to go in and talk to the investigator and have no idea that that person's already onto them and probably has picked up some things. But the minute they do, they'll start now rattling into that liar's loop we talked about. What I want you to know is all throughout each of these modules, we talk about liar's loop. It ties into the night one call. It ties into discovery of the victim, into first interaction, into first contact with the investigator, into realizing a threat. And then once the person realizes they're in a bind, then they'll start using all these details to try to defend their story. And that rationalizing piece, you're going to, we'll start going into how they try to defend their story. And then what, how we force them, and we'll show you in that module tools for forcing them into that death spiral of a lie. So that they get to a point where they can't win and they realize it, and that's when you get the confession. And we show what real confessions look like versus others. And then next steps, how do you use this? How do you take this, and how do you use this set of skills differently? What we hope is that when you sit down and watch a true crime show within about module three, by the time you get to first interaction, you're going, okay, I know where this is going. Because you've heard the 911 call, you've seen how they discovered the victim, and you see how they respond to the first person they're in contact with. And you're now you know who's done it in the show before you get to the end. That's our intent. And then we spend a fair amount of time on psychopaths. Scott's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good deal. Um, hey, uh, somebody asked here about the uh, channel, uh, JCS or Jim Can't Swim. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but like the Russell Williams interrogation, I know they did a breakdown of it there. I personally like it. Good channel. He, he does an interesting breakdown of the stuff, and it's a little different than the psychology. I wanted to jump with that a little further, though. What true crime shows do you guys like or, or who do you think does a good job we need media references for bars well in my case my wife watches all those you know i don't i'm not i don't I haven't watched a lot of them until greg said you know there's 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 a form to this there's a structure i was like what so i started watching them too because i never found those fascinating you know i just didn't i think it was that cool but now i'm looking at it going geez this is i see what they're doing here and i i see exactly what's happening in this case, so I don't have a favorite one I watch, but there you've got all the, the the classic channels which I now find myself cruising through. You know, you've got own, you've got uh, True TV, and then the the crime. Uh, what is it? The ID, yeah. all those things. You know, and on Facebook, if you get on Facebook, you can. There are hundreds of these um, true crime thing, tr true crime pages you can join. So I've I've joined a couple of those to see what's going on, see what we might, might be missing. But and there's Netflix I don't like have a favorite. Netflix has exploded with these things. You can go out oh, and watch yeah. a mini series. Some of them are and just they're done well. Some yeah, of them but, are like falling off a log. You can figure it out in two minutes. There's one of my favorites yeah. on there. That you're like, really? No. Like, what, making a murderer, for example. Uh, how, how much of watching too much of this stuff is going to traumatize or uh, a, you know reprogram a, a person's brain? Because I grew up watching these things. My mother was always into the, you know the. I think I read Helter Skelter at an abnormally young age. 
And I do wonder whether or not this actually traumatizes anybody in terms of how they perceive the world for the rest of their adult life. And like, I, I stopped watching them entirely now because I just, I, I've had enough of it. I don't want to be reminded of this. I forget what the phenomenon is where it's something where you will not write something terrible down on a piece of paper because of some underlying superstition that it might somehow bring it out, bring it about. And I, I, that's why I've, I used to love violent movies and, and all these things, but I've had enough of it. But how much of this do you think watching this nonsense and this evil reality actually rewires your brain in a bad way? Well, I can't say rewires your brain, but behavior, we all know that if you swim in oil, you, you taste like oil. <laughs> fish. If you think of a fish, whatever a fish swims in, it begins to taste like. So one of the things I said to Scott is I really don't care for true crime because it, for me, takes away a little bit of innocence. And I don't have a whole lot of it to start with from the years of doing what I did for a living. So I've always been very cautious not to do it for entertainment. And so I look at it very Scott will tell you, I'll be like, Ugh, I've been watching two hours of these knuckleheads lying about killing somebody. I'm not really even now a fan of it. I just, we found a place that we thought we could add some value is the reason we took it. I've never been a guy like people who watch movies where people cut each other up. Yeah. That part of my life ended about 1990. Isn't it more interesting to, to look at con men and yes. you know, I, 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 like I know J uh, Jerry Williams who has a great show, uh, FBI retired case file review. And she really loves looking at scammers and con people and just, you know, hates the, the violent stuff. But I mean, for example, you guys did the Robin hood CEO. Does that feel better doing somebody like that where you're like, okay, nobody's dying here, right. but right. you know, you could be conning us or not. In that, or in that case, we're, we're looking at pop culture, going back to what we were just talking about. Our mm -hmm. attitude toward this is what I think makes this so good because we're not up into the all true crime thing about it. We're, at, we're approaching it from an analytical perspective. So we, we approach it from like the people who make those shows approach it. So we see things and approach things in, in a way that makes it interesting, I think. But back to, but to the Robin Hood guy, that those things for me, I absolutely love those things because you're seeing somebody who, who is going, who's not done anything wrong. You're not going to hear anything about children being hurt. Nobody's dead, anything like that yet. So those types of things for me, I, I love those. I, I love that. I love the cons. I love the, of course, psychopaths fall into that as well. And there's a different style or type of psychopath. But the the con and and there's one called right now called the Dale, the Dale car, I think is what it is. Because my wife said, You've got to watch this. And was like, You gotta go. I was like, okay, we'll watch it. And I can't stop watching. It's on HBO. It's about the guy the the, the woman who came up with the uh three-wheel car. You gotta see it. You gotta see it. It's it's awesome. And it, and a con and psychopath from day one. It's wonderful. But <laughs> I, but I like doing these things, things like the Robin Hood guy, you know? I, I like the pop culture ones as much as anything because these are icons in our culture and you're watching them and thinking, really? Yeah, they're it's, out there running well, around I, doing stuff. I still like for crime shows, fiction is still, for me, uh, the better truth than fact in terms of shows. So, mm. the I mean, like, I love Billions. Uh, I love uh, a rant. I mean, I, and I do like Death in Paradise. Uh, that's a fun little uh, fiction crime show, crime procedural, as they're called. Um, loved Matlock and Perry Mason, of course, as a kid. Sure. Uh, you know, range of those. Th those Columbo. are all good. Yes. Columbo. Oh, yeah. You, you know what some yeah. of them could benefit from is actors getting uh, body language training, training about how they would normally behave if they were that particular kind of psychopath uh, kind of personality. You mean like Amber Heard? Oh, it sorry. may be interesting that some of them do it so naturally, uh, but uh, without any such training. But I'll leave that for another day. Speaking yeah. of actors who may have committed murders, did you guys ever do any Robert Blake? The, I, I, yeah, so we so asked you today to cover uh, Robert Wagner and Robert Blake. Robert Blake, the, mm. the Barbara Walters interview is just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but the, I, well, two things. Do you say like, you know, the psychopaths in the corporate world, the pop culture, call them sociopaths, whatever. I, I, in your own experience and all three of you, how many times do these people who can display that type of behavioral disorders in a corporate world how, how often does it translate into uh, into the you know another type of world of actual violence towards humans or animals that's at home if they do that a lot of psychopaths don't know they're psychopaths and a lot of them most of them aren't violent right most people are in the impression if you found a psychopath and gave him a knife he'd stab you and everybody else as quick as they could and that's freak rare. out that yeah that's that's not the truth that's not the truth so the psychopaths at work may approach work just hardcore, straight on. Don't give us, don't care about anyone's feelings. Fire people, do those types of Stabbed things to help the, the company or whatever. 
you know, yeah, standard. it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter to them. But then you have, uh, but when they go home, that might be a little bit of a different story. But a lot of times it's not. A lot of times they're they're just normal. They seem normal. Okay, uh, somebody's know? asking about Dexter, which I've actually never seen. I read the book. I know Dexter. Dexter chops up the people that need chopping. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the thing the thing about Dexter is everybody says he was a psychopath. He wasn't a psychopath. No, because he no, wouldn't he have had feelings for his sister. He wouldn't have had feelings about his father. He wouldn't have had these feelings. You could say he's a sociopath. There's no such thing as a sociopath. There's right. no I such agree. thing. He There's was just a, a guy who needed to chop up people, and he found the right people yeah. to chop up. That's all. There you uh, go. Jim Clemente, I've, I've talked to him before. He had an interesting thing to say about Ted Bundy, that Ted Bundy is not a psychopath. And, I'd, I'd argue with that all day long. Well, I mean, no, the reason why he said it is because he does have empathy. He takes joy out of pain, that there's a sadistic side to it. A psychopath literally doesn't have that emotion, but he has to have enough it's empathy the adrenaline. to they enjoy can, somebody he, else's pain. It's a pretty disturbing concept. Yeah, but, but it's what you're seeing there is is adrenaline. He ad enjoys the adrenaline of that and getting away with it. Well, it's I could be caught while I'm doing this. Going to be caught later on. What's going on this person? So that's that's what you're dealing with there. It's there's no joy in it for him. They don't. They're incapable of of having joy or experiencing joy, especially somebody like that. He's classic right down the line. I'll I'll I'll. I'll watch that or talk to that guy or whatever and explain to him why that's not even, that's nowhere near possible just from his, the behavior we've seen on him from the day they started uh, talking to him. We can see it in the videos they have of him. He's got the stare for sure. You can't miss it. Yeah. He's got all the, all the ear and hallmarks of psychopathy. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm one who's weird. I don't really think Manson's a psychopath. I think Mike, I mean, Manson's a nut. Punk. Yeah, he's yeah. just crazy. Well, I would say that Manson's like you know schizophrenic of sorts, and not necessarily psychopathic. I don't know how you where you draw the line between a psychopath, which would seem to be some sort of functionality, and schizophrenia, which would be a debilitating uh, sort of thing where he could not function in in society in any meaningful way. But I, uh, so I that's that a whole no, show. I mean, he's, he's just a crazy guy. I mean, there was an interesting yeah. theory. Was it? Have you guys? Do you guys watch that? It's the Mind Whatever Show, and I'm Mind Hunter. Yes. You guys watch uh, Mine Hunter at all? Yep. I watched That's, it. Now, there's a true crime, kind of true crime show that I like. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, it's in one of theirs that they explore the idea that Manson wasn't even responsible really for the murders, but his no. ego required he take credit for it mm. because he couldn't acknowledge that he wasn't who he claimed to be by conceding that other people usurped his authority to go do what they did. It was fascinating theory. I mean, mm. uh the whole Unabomber interaction was fascinating and about stopping at red lights out in the wheel, you know, all that was cool. But so that, that's a true crime show. I do like. Okay. We'll close that on that. And I've actually had a uh, James Fitzgerald who helped break the uh, quote manifesto, the Unabomber. Yeah. Um, now that was bogus fourth amendment illegal searches, but that's another story. <laughs> okay. Well <laughs> on that note, uh, the, the funny thing about the Unabomber is his manifesto is actually pretty dead on. He just had the bad side effect of blowing people up. So, <laughs> so uh, I mean, but it, it is very from that one defect. He was really a good, you know, decent you know, intellectual. He's a human other than, yeah. yeah. Aside from just sending people nail bombs and, you know, whatnot, you know, he, he meant well otherwise. You know, everybody's got to have a defect. As I remember our, uh, the buddy of mine, and I was making a joke. He was dating this girl that was an actual witch. And I was like, well, other than being a witch, he's probably okay. And I was making a joke. And he's like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. I was like, That's not what that was meant to be. <laughs> wow. Well, on that note, um, everybody go to the true crime crime workshop.com. Um, there's a coupon code. I don't know how long it'll be up there, hopefully for another week or two, but just use unstructured and you guys can get in for under Dr. Phil's price. I mean, uh, it's $69. Dr. Phil stuck up at 80 bucks. We're at 70. It's usually one, it's usually 129, but everybody's home with the, you know, yeah. it's hard to get some bucks. So we wanted to make it easy for people to get in. So that's why it's we went for one twenty nine for you. Yeah, you got the lowest one. It's sixty nine dollars if you want to get in. We love doing your so, show. Yeah, yeah instead right, of a million awesome. bucks. Or and the disclaimer is that it's not to be used for the purposes of becoming a better criminal, but rather for identifying <laughs> troublesome people that you want to avoid in life. Oh yeah, exactly. Because you don't want to go talk to one of us when you. Oh no. When you've gone oh, no, through that, and, no, I promise. Yeah, and I've had me, the behavior panel have... just just baseline me. It's not a treat. Yeah. Well, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Viva did it. That's all. <laughs> I, I, I literally couldn't kill a fly. I once, I once kill. I remember I killed a fish and then I ate it and I felt terrible, you know, for the, Ooh. for the evening. So no painful fish to eat. 
I would say the worst thing possible is you got to be clean when you're us because if you do something wrong, nobody likes us. You know, if you interrogate yeah. a prisoner, they're all going to say he's working me. I don't trust him. And well, perfect. And folks, if you like guests like this, you heard of them. They said they love being on here. So that means they've just obligated themselves to more appearances. So you need to subscribe so you can get this strange concoction and mixture that I sometimes can put together again and again. I do appreciate it. And have a great